and i believe we are live right welcome everybody to a a a random thursday hangout um i'm pleased to say that i have a special guest with me i have walter from antiques arena how are you doing mate i'm all right thank you hi to everyone thank you for having me nick no it's a pleasure i spoke to you a while back about potentially doing this and then nothing happened and and i'm really glad you got back in touch yeah, I, I just didn't have the setup. I'm using my boy's um, system now, so I'm up in his bedroom on my son's computer because I just haven't got a setup and everything. So, yeah. Yes, this is not the usual backdrop. For those of you that, that follow Walter and Walter's channel, we'll talk about that in a bit. You're usually in a shop, so perhaps that's a good introduction. Do you want to do a little bit of an introduction, actually, about who you are and, and what you do? That would be a good place to start. Um. Yeah. Um, where do I start? I'm no. Walter O'Neill. Um, been dealing antiques on car boot sales, eBay, and things for the last 15 20 years. Um, a year ago, I started making YouTube videos and I decided to open up a shop. And I make videos basically showing everything I buy at car boot sales, vi videos that shows everything that comes in the shop, and helpful videos if there's anything I can do you know how to test silver how to test gold how to identify antiques things like that. I do all those type of videos but some of the videos I've um, I've done I've you know I've gone to car boot sales and I bought a painting for 20 30 pound and put it up for 3,000 so I've had some really good finds wow so they do get interesting I tend to pick up a couple of kilos of uh, silver a month and um, gold for peanuts so yeah it's really good Okay, well, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> um, before we get into that, though, um, there is a side chat. If you're watching this live and you're logged in on a YouTube channel, please join in the side chat, pop in, say hello. If you've got any questions for Walter, um, please drop them in there or any comments. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Let me just scroll to the beginning, see who was first in. Uh, we had Lucy and Peter, regulars, always first in the chat. Hi, guys. Um, just scrolling down. I'm the legend. That is Ash. Welcome. Star Fox, uh, Baby Doe, welcome. Lee Allen is in. Gary Southwest Sellers is in. Another antique sort of dealer. I don't know if you know Gary. I'm not sure, to be totally honest with him. Okay. I had a Gary at the shop today, so I don't know if that's the same one. Um, Gary's from Exeter, so probably not. Well, I don't know. This gentleman travelled about three hours this morning. Oh. <laughs> well, he came down yeah. from Booth, through Booth Wells and everything, so he'd done a fair travel to come and see me today. Wow. Um, anyway, Gary says, good evening, Nick, Walter, and chat. So welcome, Gary. Lots of people popping in. Kay, Richard, uh, Andrea, who goes by Falling on a Breeze. So welcome, welcome. Like I say, if you do have questions, I have a bunch myself, so I'm sorry if I missed them, but pop them in the chat. If you write question in capitals, we may be able to pick it up a bit easier. So firstly, I wanted to ask, you touched on it a little bit then, but what got you started and why antiques? I didn't start with antiques. Um, I came out of the army on medical and I couldn't pay my bills. So basically, I just gathered up the things that were around the house that I didn't want and I went to car boot sales yeah. and I just sold them for a few pounds. And I'd done that for a few weeks and then family were just giving me bits that they didn't want and things. Um, and eventually, I used to watch the dealers buy it off me and I'd walk around at the end of the day happy I had £50 in my pocket and they'd be asking 30 40 £50 pound for one item they bought off me for a pound. And I just decided I want a piece of that. Yeah. And that's how I got into it. And to be honest with you, I got hooked from there. But it wasn't a cheap education. God, the mistakes I made learning, because I'm self-taught. Yeah. It's an expensive thing to learn. Because there's so many fakes, so many copies, so many reproductions. If you're, if you, if you're self-taught, you learn the hard way. You've got to pay for any, uh, any you know, trade you do. And it's a trade. Yeah, but I mean, you, you can't be scared of making mistakes either because it, it would freeze you. I mean, you know, you've got to put yourself out there and try, I guess, to learn. Yeah, but uh, as I say, now I've, I've gone from literally buying stuff for one and two pounds and selling them for five and ten to literally buying stuff for 20, 30 pounds, selling it for a thousand. So yeah. really, it does make a hell of a difference. And I tend to stick to the car boot sales because I have much better success at car boot sales and antique fairs than I do at auction. At auction, everybody's got some an expert telling them exactly what it is and what it's worth. But right. you go to an antique fair or car boot sale, and you can really grab a good bargain. You really so, can. 
So at what point did you did you take this online and sort of progress on from dealing direct to the public at boot sales? Well, I've been on eBay for years. And to be honest, I hate eBay, but it is there is nothing else that pulls the money like eBay. Oh, interesting. You, you do Amazon. I know that. You do a yeah. lot with the Amazon. Is it FDA account? FBA, yeah. For the last two days, all I've been doing is filling boxes full of toys and games. Yeah. Well, I've done eBay for, as, well, almost since its uh, conception. Uh, that's how long I've been on there. And, um, but you say uh, you, the first thing you said was, yeah, I'm on eBay and I hate it. What I, What is it about eBay that, that you dislike? I've never liked it. Um, it's impersonal, for one. Um, I like the person, you know, when you're dealing antiques, you, you meet people, you talk to them, you get to know them, you build up a relationship. And you fill up a you know a contact book and you go out and you look for buys for certain people. eBay, there's scammers on there. There's some don't be wrong, I'm not knocking it. There's some amazing buyers on there and you get some amazing money. And I've made a living off eBay for years. But you do have the ones where they'll buy something, if, especially if it's mass produced, you can buy it. If they got it damaged, they'll have yours and then they'll send the damaged one back. Yeah. It's the postage, it's the hours, it's unsociable. It's very unsociable. But at the same time, as much as I don't like eBay anymore, nothing else produces the money like it does. So so would you say you're more of a traditionalist? Because we're going to go on to this in a minute, but you set up a traditional bricks and mortar store, something I know all about, the pitfalls of that myself. I've been there far too many times. So if you could, would you, would you just be bricks and mortar face to face? Would that be the ideal scenario? If I could, yes. Yeah. Um, now... Dorothy is actually in the chat, and she's actually considering opening up the shop. Her father's going to build her a shop um, in Ohio, and same. She'll probably experience the same as what I, I've experienced at the beginning of opening the shop. It was a boom. I was doing one two thousand pound a day out the shop, literally a day. Wow! Fantastic. Um, then after Christmas, it took a hell of a nosedive, and I'm, I make a decent wage. Don't get me wrong. But I buy more than I sell in the shop. I spend a thousand pound a week in the shop on what I buy. So that then goes on to eBay and other sources. So I make as much from what I buy or more from what I buy than I do from selling in the shop. So my selling has to be split over. In order to have a very successful business, it has to go over eBay, um, the shop, still car boot sales, because I, I got to move the stuff I don't want. and. Yep. possibly the occasional antique fair, just to move it all. Because I'm literally, I have 10 or 15 people a day come in the shop trying to sell me stuff. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Do you follow um, Craigslist Hunter over in America on YouTube? No. No, you, I don't. You find that interesting because he has an over-the-counter antiques and collectibles and pretty much anything, to be honest. Yeah. A huge setup. And I find his videos fast fascinating. It'd be worth you having a look at that. I love a look at that one. Yeah, Craigslist Hunter. I've had him on the channel for a chat. He's a fascinating guy, originally from Poland, uh, yeah. now in America. Yeah, wonderful guy. Um, there was a couple of questions coming. Let me have a quick scroll back. Um, oh, Gary says, yeah, it wasn't him that was in your shop, uh, <laughs> but he does subscribe to your channel. Oh, there you go. So thank you, Gary. Um, now, this is a <laughs> probably an impossible question to ask, but I suppose just for you and your experience right now, Matt asks, what's the hottest thing to buy at the moment in the way of antiques? What are you finding people want right now? 20th century studio glass. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's, it's, you know, people are getting more money for a bit of Scandinavian glass or Home Guard or Rimaki, that type of thing, the, the 60s and that period glass, than you will a Georgian vase. Um, you can have an 18th century cut glass Irish vase and pull I don't know, 50 pounds, 60 pounds for an hour. But yet you can get a home guard vase that's pulling 200 pounds. It's shocking how much money the 20th century factory glass is getting. Right. So is that the more minimalist stuff, simple it's stuff? stuff with the bright orange colours and the shapes and right. that type of thing. Right. But everybody's going for that. Do you know, back five, six, seven years ago, I could buy white fryers for a pound at car boot sales and dealers would leave me there. They didn't want to know. Then it just rocketed up and you know like a drunken bricklayer or hoop vase is like three four hundred pounds it's stupid money and you could buy them for nothing you know let's say 10 years ago you could literally dealers walk past them yeah that's the mad thing about the antiques world well any buying and selling we all know that, that trends come and go but in the antiques world it is like a a proper roller coaster isn't it i mean in a couple of years what you just talked about could be reversed completely i'll give you an example um lady come into oh, 
a lady and a man come in the shop last week and I bought about 25 Royal Dalton figurines off them. Um, now, people, when they bought the Royal Dalton figurines, that's, the Royal Dalton's the name, is porcelain figurines, and basically they would have been, I know, 150, 200 pounds, 300 pounds to buy new. And uh, going back five, seven years ago, you were still getting good money. I ended up giving them a tenner a figure. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to actually make a huge profit on them when I sell them. I'll probably double my money or maybe get 25 quid after costs. It's shocking the way things, prices move. Yeah, it's just fashions and trends, basically, yeah. isn't it? There's not much more to it than that, I don't think. No. No. But you but still get the rock solid antiques, you know. 18th century porcelains, you know, mice and worcesters, things like that. The rock solid ones are still always safe to bet in. Um, but I tell you what, um, I I bought some beautiful paintings uh, this year. And for example, I bought um, a piece by Samuel Prout. One was by Samuel Prout, and I can't think of the other one off the top of my head now. Anyway, um, I took them to Barnum's because I just wanted them authenticated. So I'm not an expert on paintings, I know what I'm doing, but I'm not an expert. And they authenticated them, and they're talking about them in the League of Turner and things like that. And Turner pulls millions. Yeah. She said, you was Turner, and you was just underneath by you. And she said, they're millions. That's a couple of thousand. Yeah. Purely because people don't want that stuff on the wall anymore. But if you've got the name, like Turner, where, how can they say one's, you know, worth, still worth a fortune and another ring? Because it's not in trend. But the names, if you've got the name, it's still so pulling money. So with paintings, do you go on, I like the look of that, I've never heard of this artist, or do you have a list of artists in your head or on your phone, or how do you judge a painting? I'm a general dealer, I'm not a specialist in any subject, to be honest with you, Nick. Um, so I go off gut instinct out on the quality of the piece, how, how it looks, how it, the balance is, and just the quality. And then do the research afterwards later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one painting I bought, I done a video um, about three months ago. I bought a painting down in Cardiff in Slot, Carbutel. And a dealer came up to me and he said, I bought that this morning. It's a really nice watercolor. Do you want it? You want it £50. And it was dark. It was like 4.30 in the morning. Mm. I could hardly see it. And I knocked him down a bit. I said, I ain't paying her. I said, it's a gamble. I don't know who it is. And I ended up giving him £30. When I come home, I actually put a photograph of the signature on the Token Antiques website and on my Antiques Arena website. Mm -hmm. and within an hour I'd add it down with a bit of help and literally it's up now for three thousand pounds wow that's amazing it, yeah. it, it was interesting um there was a question uh from Lee Allen actually on this subject who said question what is the best way to find the value of a painting so you just explain one way there just putting the information out on the internet and finding finding out just, what people know just while I remember now it was the George Shalders was the painting I bought just come to me but there's actual websites you can uh, register at uh, that give you the listed artists and prices and things but the trouble you got when you buy a genuine piece like I had that George Childers for 30 quid and genuinely I didn't know if it was stolen or not mm -hmm. so the biggest worry you got then is if you pay a couple of hundred pounds for a really good painting and it turns out to be something incredible is it stolen and I'll give you a, a story about a friend of mine back a few years ago. He bought a painting at car boot sale for three pounds. Sorry, auction house for three pounds in a job lot of paintings. He'd done the research on it and it turned out it was worth 15,000. When he actually uh, contacted the um, people uh, about it, they said that actually belonged to the charity and it should never have been um, you know, sold. So the charity went through their um, history and they couldn't figure out, they could place it up to something like 1960, but from 1960 and when he bought her in 2000, they couldn't find it. They, there was no record of where it was. So they then reported the painting as stolen after he'd notified him he had it and he had a visit off the police and he turned on the police and said, on your bike, you can't report something stolen after I've contacted them 40 years later. Yeah. It's, it's got to be a civil matter. Now in the end, he gave the painting over um, to the back to the charity because he didn't want a big legal battle and the charity were willing to fight to get the painting back. But you, with anything like art, you've got to be very careful before you spend any real money. There's some serious quality fakes out there and you don't know if it's stolen. Absolutely. I mean, there's been some amazing programs on the TV that I'm sure you've watched as well with fascination where they're creating fakes and looking oh, yeah. into how, how people copy stuff and 
to be fair, the skill involved in doing it is amazing. But it does scare that. I mean, I've never really dealt in paint. I bought a few little watercolors just because yeah. I thought they were nice and sold them for 20, 30 quid when they were 20p. Yeah. Beyond that, I don't have any confidence in it. So I've never really dabbled, but I admire the fact that you have and you've done well out of it. I don't spend any real money on it, to be honest with you. I gamble that if it's a, if it's a, you know, not a decent name or if it's anything, I, I gamble what I can think I can get decorative value. Yeah. And that's how I buy it. If I can buy it on a decorative value, then I will. But the forgers out there, I'll give you an example. Chinese porcelain, uh, you know, one vase can pull 50 million. I don't know if you saw on the news back a few years, it was a house clearance and they found a vase in the house. Mm. And they had 53 million for this Chinese porcelain, imperial porcelain vase. And China actually took Sotheby's to court to try and stop them selling it. Well, there are companies now who are reproducing Chinese porcelain in the Qing <coughs> period style, that good that they're fooling experts, that in America, there's actual auctions that are selling nothing but the fakes and selling them as real. I follow a gentleman um, on, on YouTube who only does Chinese porcelain. And he's actually doing videos now just showing you the Chinese fakes. That's how, uh, how good they are. Yeah. So there's four just for everything. Well, when, where the money is, there'll be people trying exactly. to fake whatever it is. I mean, and it goes all the way through to Pokemon. I was chatting with Tom the other night about Magic the Gathering and Pokemon cards. People yeah. fake those because they're valuable. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is, does it? If there's value there, the criminals will soon follow. Well, I bought a Kew Gardens 50 pence piece from my local uh, news agents back about a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I gave him 50 pounds for it. But before I gave him 50 pounds, I was on online checking where the fake ones are and I have to tell them apart because they've even faked the 50 pence pieces now. Wow. And there's four or five indicators on the, like the Kew Gardens 50 pence piece. Um, like at the bottom of the bill, then there's two lines instead of one line on the fakes and things like that. There's little telltale signs. But they fake the 50 piece that good that they pass in circulation, even with banks. Yeah. I had one of those. And you can you can probably tell where this is going. I it was in my pocket and I spent it. I didn't realise I spent the wrong fifty P. So yeah. No, <laughs> never again. Um Karen is in. Hi Karen. She says, I don't understand antiques, but I'm starting to look at diversifying off clothing, but looking at glass, etc. I think if I like it, someone else will and build a knowledge that way. I think that's a safe way to start. Would you agree? It is, yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I feel like there's always someone else is going to like it. But the safest way to buy it is buy it cheap. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If you're looking at a glass vase, for example, and you think, all right, well, they want a fiver or they want a tenner for that. But I don't know if it's modern or if it's old. As long as it's decorative, you're always going to get your money back. Yeah. And if it turns out to be something good, there's thousands of different sites online. One of the sites I use is 20th Century Factory Glass, and they have an encyclopedia of all the 20th century glass um, out there. So if you know if you buy a bit of Bagley, Sowerby, you know, anything. Um, I bought some pieces the other day, um, and I didn't even know they were myself. I went on the site. Within five minutes, I had them down and the designer. So it's a good site. There's loads of tools online for identification of glass. Mm. But I tend to do videos anyway on things like that. And if, like Carnival Glass, I'd done a video on Carnival Glass back probably a year ago. And I'm not an expert on it, but what, what I'd done is I gave them what little knowledge I had and then directed them to a website where they can see all the fakes and see all the patterns and that type of thing. Yeah. So there are tools on there. But the yeah. best way is by a, by a cheap. I think a lot of it comes down to confidence and, and a big reason I don't tend to. I've picked up all sorts over the years and dabbled, you know what I mean? But I've never really built up enough confidence. But it's interesting hearing you say that because Andrew and I have dealt in uh, vintage 70s and 80s toys since we started doing this. Yeah. And there's similar websites for My Little Pony and He-Man, <laughs> how to identify fakes. And Andrew's done a video on that. It just fascinates me that they're the antiques of the future, genuinely. Definitely. It's these toys. Yeah, they pay more for the 60s and 70s stuff than they are, as they say, Georgian. It's shocking. Yeah, yeah. amazing. I don't actually have many toys in like yourself. Mm. Very few toys come in and over the door. It's shocking. And and weird things like this. This is a 1980s um, camcorder, the one that was in the uh, Back to the Future film. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm struggling to get it working right now, but that's a couple of hundred quid, potentially. It's just, yeah. It's probably more the decorative art, though, than it would uh, to be used now. Um, a lot of it's used in cosplay, people that are dressing up and going yeah. to conventions. 
beyond that, I don't know if it's just collectors or what it is. Because to um, be honest, I'm, a lot of what I do is decorative arts. And to be honest, a camera like that, I'd sell as decorative. Mm. Whether it was there to dress up, um, you know, a camera shop as a prop or anything along them lines. Well, um, I'm sure you're aware a lot of it goes to movie production houses, theatre production houses, uh, for sets, TV and all sorts. We've sent stuff to all sorts of different it's fascinating places. Um, and a lot of people in the chat chat group, the Facebook group that I run, have said, I've, I've just sent something off to a film set. I've sent something off to ITV studios or whatever it is. So that this stuff ends up on TV and film quite often. Well, a lot of my stuff ends up in museums. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Let me just dip in the chat again. Oh, well, Matt has just said, um, what is Walter's channel? There is a link below to Walter's uh, YouTube channel and the Facebook group that we've already mentioned. Um, you've already touched on what sort of videos you make and that. What was the reasoning behind you starting YouTube? What got you into that in the first place? I started YouTube as a way of advertisement and promotion. I thought if I give free content and help people um, with the basics. Mm -hmm. There's no other channel out there at the time that basically would say, okay, this is an 18th century glass. This is how you identify this 18th century glass. This is what to look for. Or a piece of solid silver. This is how to test it with acid. This is the fakes and so on. And I thought, if I'm giving away the free information that way, they're then going to, well, my channel, my, my shop, everything would be exposed to that. And then the uh, customers would filter down. So I originally started purely as an advertisement and promotion. And did that pay off? Well, we were chatting about this before, that you get people traveling did. crazy um, distance to come and see I, you. So. I have people, well, I've had people come um, well, from all over the country, to be honest with you. I have, we have friends up in Sheffield that come down now once or twice a year. Um, gentleman today come, I don't know how far he came, but um, he come down, passed through Booth Wells and everything. So he had a three hour drive to come and see me today. Um, and we've got to imagine, I'm a very small little shop in Mountain Ash, which is a little valley in nowhere. And yet people are still traveling three and four hours to see me. Sorry, I was distracted by a ka -ching. It's all right. I can't, I can't resist looking. <laughs> That's why I turned mine off. <laughs> yeah. So, so for those, um, obviously, if, if you're in the UK, you'll recognize the accent. You're in Wales. So whereabouts, um, you just roughly described it how, how would it be I'm about 17 you? miles out of cardiff okay right south then okay yeah south wales fantastic um a couple of people you've had on you not that long ago caroline is it uh she's very close to me yes caroline and phil yeah they're close to me because they got the same car boot sale as me they got together to get oh okay have you met up with those guys or not i've seen them a few times at the boot sale i have never met up with them but i have seen them a few times yeah, lovely, lovely people, mate. Yeah, go and say hi next time you see him. I uh, I know, um, I'm not sure if it was Caroline or somebody else, but we were at Gathley Gay and they don't like, they don't allow you to film in Gathley Gay boot cell. So I have to film my buys when I go home. She will not allow you film in the boot cell. And I think it was Caroline, I might be wrong, but I think it was Caroline who was walking down and she was talking to a camera and the woman came running down going absolutely nuts. Really? <laughs> Why would they care? I'm not what does it make, it? Sorry. I don't know what difference it would make, but uh, she did, yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to, because I use my phone, I just hold my phone in my hand and walk around and point at what I'm looking at when I do boot sale hunting videos and nobody ever notices. How did you manage when you filmed the auction? Did the auction give you permission? Because you filmed a live auction, didn't you? Yeah, I, I never seek permission. If somebody tells me to stop and I can't, I stop. I've always been the kind of way that I, I do things until someone tells me to stop. If there's obvious signs up, I'm not going to step yeah. over that line. But yeah, I find in life I do stuff until someone tells me I can't. No, that's fair enough. <laughs> I'm the other way around. Someone tells me I can't, that's when I want to do it. Yeah, oh, I've always been like that. Yeah. I'm a rebel without a clue most of the time. Yeah, me too. Oh, Lex is in there uh, as well. I don't know if you've watched any of Lex's videos. Don't know. Um, she's got some wonderful antiques and stuff and vintage clothing. Do you deal at all in clothing? That was another question I had. No. Um, to be honest, though, clothing is alien to me. Hmm. I don't think, short of, you know, a couple of nice badger skin hats and things like that, I'm, and, you know, the decorative heart side of it, I've never done anything with clothing other than fur. 
and I don't do that now because it's so politically incorrect. Yeah. I don't even do fur anymore. Yeah. So I tend to stay away from that because that can cost you more than uh, you earn. Yeah. yeah. And if you had it in the shop, for example, you could lose customers if they walked in. You know, if my wife walked in and you had fur coats hanging up, she'd walk straight out probably. Well, touching on that subject, there's a lot of stuff I don't put in the shop. Um, back, I think it was about six months ago, um, I had some men come in and they sold me a World War II collection in a box. I hadn't gone through it. They just said it was all Nazi stuff. Mm. Uh, I didn't want it in the shop. I gave them £100 for it and I didn't want it in the shop. And, you know, I made a YouTube video on it and I had museums chasing me for the stuff. I ended up moving it up um, to another dealer I did, a friend of mine. Um, but, well, some of the stuff, but I wouldn't put it in the shop because I thought if I put that in the shop, it's going to cost me more customers than the money I'm going to make off that product. Yeah. But there's lots of things I won't actually touch in the shop, period. Did you see the pickup I had uh, about three months back of the Nazi photograph collection? No. Yeah, must have very similar to what you had. I might have to speak to you about that off air because I haven't done anything with that, but I had a, an auction house really interested. Nothing came of that yet. Had a private collector contact me, but the, the deal yeah. fell through. I'll yeah. give you the name of the man who bought all my stuff, and he paid a very good price. Okay, yeah, we'll have to have a chat. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just have a dip in side chat before we move on. Um, Stu Mandry says, going back to fates, one thing to remember about antiques is if something has value, you can guarantee someone will be trying to produce fakes. Exactly what we were saying. Yeah, definitely. You have to be cautious. You got Crinoline 876 there. I've asked, do I travel to Europe? To be honest with you, I don't go out of the uh, country. I stay in the UK, but I have traveled to Lincoln and Newark and places like that. I've traveled and spent weekends and things like that away um, and traveled back then three days later after sleeping in the boot of the car, wrapping the stock up in a tarpaulin outside the car and sleeping in the car out of the rain. Um, but no, I've never left the UK buying antiques. Thank you for the super chat, by the way, Krillin. Welcome. Appreciate that. I'm I'm quite far behind in the chat. I was trying to catch up. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to have to go to the end. If, I'm sorry if I've missed any questions out. It's difficult to keep the conversation going and read the chat. Um, okay. Sorry, just reading. Uh, Jamie says, I sell Militaria all day long. I have the only one in the Midlands been offered by YouTube to do a live chat, but I was very shy to accept. Okay. Um, so what else did I have? I think we've already covered most of these questions. This is normally what happens. Oh, I have one here. Do you work alone? Do you have help or do you have family that get involved with the business? How does it work? I work alone, um, but I do have a best friend who does help. Yes, um, I've seen her in the videos. Yeah, Sandra, she's lovely, but she's nuts. Um, it used to be when I was only working eBay, she'd help, she'd come to the house, I'd be listing, she'd be rapping for me. Um, and now she she always come around the car boot sales with me, but purely just keep camp me and have a day out and see what she can find for herself for the house. And now she just visits at the shop, mm. but she does keep me company at the shop because it you know it can be a long day at the shop. I'm there six days a week. I'm there from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon, every, you know, every day. So it can be a long day. So if anybody thinks this job's easy, it's not. I work seven days a week. I don't have a day off. Yeah, retail it is quite tying, isn't it? Certainly with, with time because you have to be there. You can't sell anything if you're not physically there. So, it yeah, that's your time tied up. Um, and we did that for nearly a decade with the gaming shop. Yeah, And it, and it wore us out, I'll be honest. Because we kept expanding and expanding, and it and it just outgrew us, and we were so stressed by the end of it, we had to get out. But bizarrely, I miss it. I miss the the regulars. I miss the like you were saying before. eBay is very impersonal. I don't speak. To, I can sit here at my desk all day and not speak to another soul apart from my wife. Yeah. Whereas when I had the shop, every five minutes someone will come in and say, "Hi, Nick. How are you doing?" Yeah. And, I, and I miss that element of it. I have an old couple come in literally five days a week. Um, just to chat and say hello. Yeah. Every day, Monday to Friday, they come in just to say hello, see how I am. I had a carry bag of fruit dropped in today because uh, they know I'm on a diet. So, you know, 
there's a surprising oh, amount of people out there who are literally just lonely and want to pop in and say hello yeah. we we found that because we were open for so long we built up a lot of people who if they were in town they would make a point of coming in and spending 10 minutes just having a chat mm -hmm. because yeah. they lived alone or didn't have that social outlet and i became that person for a lot of people there's and I, I miss that a bit it's not just other people as well to be honest with you. i found i became very antisocial as well where i worked online for so long and I weren't around people. I used to go to the car boot sale and I wouldn't even talk to a soul. I'd go to the car boot sale and my only words would be, how much is that? And I'd either buy it or not and walk away. Mm. Um, it was stuff when I started taking Sandra to the boot sale that she started talking to everybody and dragged me in with it. That sort of got me talking again because I went through a, a spell where I wouldn't even talk to people. I was very antisocial. So that's another side of eBay that you know affects you more than you realize. As yeah. you said today, you've been there all day and the only person you've talked to is your wife. Yeah. Well, going back to YouTube and, and one thing that, that I've, I've mentioned it in the past in live hangouts, but before I started this, which is now like three and a half, four years ago, I guess now I started YouTube. Yeah. I really was isolated with this and you kind of get in your head, you know, you're not the only person doing this, but you feel like you are. And then when I, I, I took the plunge and did YouTube, it just opened up this whole social world of, of like-minded people doing the same thing that understand the issues we have. And that was a game changer for me. It really opened up my my online social world. So that's been great. Have you found that with um, YouTube and, and Facebook? Has that been helpful for you? One thing I, I've done with YouTube I didn't expect, I've actually made a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can call them subscribers, followers, whatever you want to, but out of it all, I've actually made quite a lot of friends that I text, that to talk, you know, to actually spend the time to actually see how I am and ask how I'm doing, things like that. Yeah. Surprise, and it's not just, it may have started out as a venture for advertisement and promotion, but it grew into so much more. It actually grew into a community. That's the only way I can explain it. Um, you know, I, I actually try my best now to fit my videos that, you know, my friends or some of the followers I got to a friendly uh, like. I don't know if that makes sense or if I'm rambling there, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I think when you were saying before about about the videos that um, that are, are instructional about antiques, and you were saying that there's not many people doing that. That sounds like a whole world of content you could do. You could, you could never stop making videos about how to spot something, or yeah. you could go on making videos till till the end of your days, couldn't you? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I've been doing it for a year, and I've made four and a half hundred videos in a year. Yeah. Wow, that's good going. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> yeah, I think I've done about eight hundred in four years. So yeah, so yeah. Well, I was doing one a day, um, you know, for the first year, and I'm, I'm into my second year now. I'm about two or three months into my into my second year of actually making videos. I've had the YouTube account for five, six years. Right. But I think I've only been making videos for about fourteen months or fifteen months. So it's not it's not that long when you actually think about it. But I was doing one a day. Are you finding that, that some of the kind of how-to instructional videos have a life beyond your subscriber base? Because I found that with some of my videos, which explain nuts and bolts about something, yeah. get tens of thousands or, or, or way more views, which obviously isn't my subscriber base. So they have a life of their own, which which I think is great. Uh, it's not just them. The the my my brother, you know, he does a gardening show, so his films are very limited as in he has to wait for something to grow before he can film it with myself i pick up an antique i talk about the antique i pick up a book on the antiques I'll, I'll do a book review um there is literally and I'm, I'm unlimited if it's raining outside i'll simply go into the office go and I'll, have that, and I'll make a video on that it is that simple for me yeah um in comparison to some other people who got to make the videos and wait for content or yeah. things like that my content is simply whatever i got around me yeah, I think it's fantastic. I really hope it grows. I was just noticed Kirsten is in. I don't know if you uh, have yeah, watched any of Kirsten's Kirsten. videos. Yeah, because of course, uh, for those that don't know, Kirsten's Curiosities um, was doing YouTube. I'm not sure that she still is, um, but set up a shop and and deals in antiques and collectibles. So welcome, Kirsten. Hope you're well. Um, okay. Karen says, that's what I love about the live Hangouts. Um, we are like a bunch of work colleagues. Exactly. Like-minded people you can you can moan about eBay too. <laughs> oh dear. The treasure pirate there, um, she actually does um, videos as well, very similar. 
Yes. In yeah, America. America. Yeah, she's been on the channel before. Lovely lady. Um, uh, Lee says, Walter, whereabouts uh, in our lovely country are you from? We have mentioned that, but do you want to say again? Um, I'm in the Merthyr, well, the Rhondacan and Taff Valleys in South Wales. If you can understand my accent, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Malcolm says, can we have a link to Walter's channel? It should be below in the description box. If it's not for some reason, I did put it there. If it's vanished, just put in your search bar, Antiques Arena. Either there's two words or there's one. Both work, I checked. Uh, and you'll find it straight away. So it's not difficult. But there should be a link below. If there isn't, I will put it straight in after this video. Um, Baby Doe 42 over there is just commenting basically she don't feel alone and things thanks to us. So I just touched on because she's one of the friends I talked to on um, from my YouTube videos and she's in Ohio so just saying hi to her there because um, she's been really nice chatting back and forth. Mm. Um, so it's just an example, um, you know, another one of the friends I've made since doing this YouTube. Yeah, and it's, and it's truly international. We have regulars from America, Australia, etc., as I'm sure you do. And it, yeah, it really shrinks the world. Um, Kirsten says, shop's going okay, thanks, which is fantastic. Last time, um, last one of Kirsten's I saw, I think she was uh, talking about the, um, the shelves in her shop compared to the units. I don't know how she got on after. Did you give up the rented units afterwards? I think it was uh, Kirsten was talking about the rented units versus a shop. Right. Um, yeah, Baby Doe, who you just mentioned, says, I started three years ago when I went garage selling with my daughter. She was mm -hmm. buying and selling on Facebook groups, then I started on eBay. And she also says, you are a natural at filming videos, Edward. Ah, see, she's calling you Edward. I got confused earlier. <laughs> yeah, my name is Walter Edward, so it is both. They are both right. I've had plenty of people say to me, well, you walk from your videos, I'll come you Edward, but it's, my name is Walter Edward. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm losing track of the, the chat. I love the interaction, but it makes it really hard to keep up. Um, oh, Kirsten says, my hubby and I are hoping to have a weekend trip to Wales. We'll hopefully pop in and see you, Walter. There you go. Sounds good. I shall uh, guess, uh, get the camera ready to take some photos. <laughs> yeah, get the kettle on. I, do you know what? I, um, first thing I do when uh, somebody comes is uh, off YouTube is I offer him a cup of tea. Richard, who's in the chat, he comes pretty much regular on a Friday. And first thing I do is kettle on. Yep. Straight away. Um. Okay, let me see if I ran out of questions or not. Um, we kind of touched on this one. Um, I was going to ask you, picking up antiques, of any notable finds. You mentioned that picture. Can you think of another couple of examples of things, perhaps things that surprised you, maybe? Um, <laughs> to be honest, though, it's, it's where I go and the way I do it now, I tend to do really well anyway. Now, I bought... A lot of silver in the shop the other day. I didn't really get to go through it. Um, they come in, they wanted two hundred pound. They give them the two hundred pound for the all the silver. It was seven hundred and fifty grams. Ended up being a platinum watch inside it that I scrapped out for four hundred and fifty. Um, but that type of figure is regular for me. Uh, to be honest, where I'll buy something in cheap and do a few hundred on it. So for it to be something special, it's got to be like the George Childers or the Samuel Proud. I bought the Samuel Proud for three pound. Mm. And it's, I think it's Prague Bridge or George, it's a bridge in Prague anyway. Um, and that's up to a thousand pound or fifteen hundred pound for four pound. So you so don't you always get those buys more stuff than not when you're doing antiques. That you go out and you spend a fiver, you make 20 or 30 pound or 40 pound. But every every so often, and the more you, you go out there and put yourself out there, you do find the big score, they do turn up. Yeah, and that's what we're all after, in all honesty. It's not about the money. I couldn't give a monkey how much the item is worth. It's the, the thrill you get when you actually found that rare piece in your home and you jump up and down thinking, ah, it's mine. Right. <laughs> I, don't care, I don't care what it's worth. 
I've had I've owned pieces that belonged in Cavartha Castle from William Crochet's and I've had some really rare pieces over the years. And you know, I still go to a car boot sale if I pick up a I haven't seen one for many years now, a Newcastle like Bluster or Heavy Bluster, which is an early drinking glass uh, from 1720, 1730. And they used to be worth like six, seven, eight hundred pounds. And used to buy them um, in a box of glasses for a pound all the time. Because yeah. people would come to a car boot sale with Georgian glass. It's very hard to tell what it is if you don't know. And they put all the glasses out. I don't know, you go to car boot sales, you see all the stores with all the glasses on the table, and nobody has a clue where they are. Yeah, and they can't uh, get rid of it either. It used to be my stable diet. I'd go to a store, I'd pick up an 18th century drinking glass with a nice folded foot or something for 50p or a pound, and I'd sell it for a couple of hundred. Wow. But it wasn't the money, it'd be the thrill of I'd be going home and I'd almost be caressing it all the way home, <laughs> just loving it. Yeah, I, I get the same thrill from the stuff I pick up and that never goes. It never fades, does it? It's weird. Do you know, I don't gamble, I don't drink, I don't do nothing. I have enough thrill from going bargain hunting, if you like, or treasure hunting. Yeah. You, you just can't beat it. There's nothing else that compares to finding something that's been owned by royalty or something really beautiful. And when you look at some of the car boot sale finds that have been in the news over this last year, um, I think somebody bought a silver ring on the car boot sale that turned out to be platinum with a couple of carats of diamond. They had 350000 for £10. That was sold this year. Somebody else up in England found the earliest gold ever known to exist in this country um, in a box of scrap of watch parts. So, you know, you can have some real good finds. And I just... That that's the thing, isn't it? It's all still out there, you know. But, but it's not all the money with it either. It's more, you know, the fact I found it. Yeah, I dug it up and I found it. That's what it is. It's not the money side of it. The money helps, <laughs> but it's the Absolutely. thrill. Of yeah, it. yeah. We all we all need the money to keep going. But yeah, definitely. So, so plans. I mean, do you have plans for the shop? I mean, do you want to describe the shop and the scale of it, and and then maybe what your plans are for that? My, sh my shop at the moment is very small. I got two rooms, and uh, first is about 20 foot squared, second is about 10 foot square, 15 foot square. So it is a very small shop. Now I have been looking to extend. Um, I was gonna buy a larger shop in the same town because I'm doing well where I am. Um, and the gentleman came up to me and he wanted between 80 and 120,000 and I just felt it was way too much money. But what I want, um, my dream has always been I wanted an antique center. So I wanted something massive. And I mean, you know, four stories or the size of Tesco's or B&Q or something. And I wanted to fill it with cabinets and units and rent them out and have my own little area and work in it myself and rent it out. Mm -hmm. That's always been my dream. But I, I almost done that rather than opening up the shop where I am now. But the costs, um, now I done a chat on this the other day, pure, the pure council tax rates the business on the square footage was astronomical it was something like nine thousand pound a year just for the rates for the council rates uh then it was another nine nine or ten thousand pound for rent and the shop wasn't massive so when you actually broke it down into the cost i'd have to charge per unit i have to make 700 pound a week before i actually made a penny profit yeah so uh, it was just ridiculous that, that's what killed our last venture when we set up our last shop I mean, you can imagine what it's like in Hitchin. We're 30 miles out of London. Rates here are just sickening. It's 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 crippling our, our town centres here. It's just you know, if I walk to Aberdeen there and I walk around the town, 50% of the shops are shut. Yeah. If I go to Merthyr, 50% of them shops are shut. No matter where you go, the shops are shut in everywhere because they can't afford the business rates. Yeah. It's not that it's not that people don't know how to you know run a business. It is simply there is only so much money you can make off product. And with online buying and everything else today, you would think the councils would abolish council tax and you know put put extra charge on after we sell it. You know, bill us if we make the money, that type of thing. So yeah, I mean they introduce reliefs and stuff, but it, no, not anymore. We yeah. you can have um, relief, um, I think, but they don't do introduction rates and they don't do if you're on you know if you're not turning over a certain amount things like that they don't do no, nothing like that over here no because i tried all them angles with them i said to them well give me a year to get set up and then i'll, I'll pay the council rates fine because i'll need the first year to fill all the units they didn't want to know then i said well all right well 
do I get a discount because I'm not earning that much because I'm only now starting out? No, no. full price from start. Um, the only relief you get is if you're in a conservation area where they're trying to regenerate the area, then you get the council tax relief. Because that's what I always wanted. I want something big. But I've always had dreams of going big. <laughs> I never uh, never limit myself, as they say. If you're going to dream, you might, as well dream. you might as well dream big, right? <laughs> I think the only time, going back to rate relief, I think the only time we had it was when we were renting some storage space. Yeah. It's based on the cost of the rent that we got um, small business rate relief. But that's going back now about four years. It's just when I started YouTube. So I don't know if they've changed all of that. But when we had the shots, we had no help whatsoever and it was crippling. Anyway, we could moan about that all day. Uh, let's see what the chat's saying. Uh, let me say uh, hi to Sandra there. She just said hello. Uh, oh, Sandra, is that your Sandra in the chat there? Um, okay, let's see if there's any more questions. I think I missed some questions. Somebody was asking about, um, Aaron said, hi, how do you source stock in the winter? And have either of you ever played, have you ever played pants down? Because it's fun. I've no idea what that is. I don't know what pants down is, but um, <laughs> sourcing stock in the winter, let me see. Uh, I'm fortunate I have indoor car boot sales around here. Um, Splot Market is in a big, massive undercover hangar, if you like, almost an airplane hangar. So that runs all year round on a Saturday. I have best which runs Saturday and Sunday. It's not all undercover. They have undercover on the edges and people sit there, believe it or not, in the rain in the winter. They don't care. They'll sit there and sell in the rain. And we have Bridgen Multi-Story Car Park, which is all year round. So I'm very fortunate the car boot sales are there all year. I don't go to the auctions even in the winter because I... How can I put this? Um, I go to an auction I view and I get myself so wet up over the items, I don't sleep in the night. And then I go to the auction and I either overpay or I have to go on and feel defeated because I haven't won the item because basically, you know, they're willing to pay more than I can afford to pay. Yeah. In the day, I got to make my margin, cover my costs, and make enough. So I tend to find other dealers will pay more than what I pay for stock. That's why I buy at car boot sales and antique fairs. If you go to an antique fair, as I've said already, you've got an auction here that tells you what it is, what it's worth. I'd rather go to an antique fair and pit my knowledge against other dealers' knowledge and a bit of luck and come on with stuff that you pay a ten or four, make 50 quid or 100 quid, and buy enough of them to get you done. But yeah, I don't go to the auction in the winters. I am, I'm hoping this year so far, the amount of stock coming in the shop has been more than I can handle. So I'm hoping that continues. And obviously my car boot sells in the uh, winter. But biggest thing I do, my office is full, my garage is full, my attic's full. I hoard through the summer. Yeah. I overbuy in the summer and I hoard it. So if I have a quiet winter, or I can't be bothered to get up because I'm a lazy basket. And one night, I'll, um, I got enough stock. Yeah. I was um, just thinking that the last of my questions I just had a look that we didn't cover was, now I know you're a real family man. Um, your your kids, are they interested? Are you trying to get them interested? My daughter, my daughter steals jewellery like it's not tomorrow. Oh, really? Um my youngest boy steals all my weapons. Right. So if I come home with daggers, axes, swords, he, he steals all those. Um, my middle son, he's not really worried. Uh, my oldest boy, he's just into gaming big time. Uh, but I've taken him to car boot sales many times. Um, yeah, they're all right. They, uh, they do like it. Do so, you think they, they would they would go down that route in the future or would you would you encourage that or not to be honest with you yeah i haven't got a problem um as far as i'm concerned i've told my daughter many times that you know i would happily take her with me and she could specialize in costume jewelry you know costume jewelry it sounds cheap but it isn't it really isn't vintage costume jewelry can be dearer than gold and silver right um you know you can get a little baker like brooch and it can be 100 pounds you know what i mean or a bit of amber genuine antique amber is pretty much 10 pound a gram you know that's as dear as nine carat gold mm -hmm. so yeah i've i said to her i'll teach her the costume jewelry and things i said she can't have the, the precious metals because i need them to pay the mortgage and the bills but i'd take her out and i'd let her have the costume jewelry and i teach her that way um and but the trouble is she said she'll do it but she don't want to part with the stuff 
<laughs> she'll come with me and she'll buy it, but she'll keep it. Right. So she's in the collecting frame of mind still at the moment. Definitely. Yeah. Um, my oldest boy actually runs the shop for me if I'm stuck. If I don't want to shut the shop and I'm stuck, I say to my oldest boy, if he's not in work, go down and run the shop for the day for me. And he's done that plenty of times. Well, so I do, I do involve the children. And if we go out, um, for example, let's say we go down the beach, I have to stop the charity shops while we're down there so that I'm working at the same time as being out. And they yeah. understand that. And over the years, I've done that all the time. And I've turned you know, a day out that's expensive with the kids and covered it with what I bought in charity shops. Exactly. Oh, I love doing that. I love, I love popping out somewhere. <laughs> Got to do it. Lunch by picking up one board game or something like that. Yeah, it's great. Um, Kirsty's just asked a question. Uh, we'll wrap this up soon because we've been on 50 minutes. So we'll do a couple more little questions. Um, Kirsten said, Walter, do you get free stuff? I've had people give me stuff because they want rid. Yes. Uh, many a times um, people come in the shop and say, just have that and dump a box on me and walk out. And half the time I don't want it. Um, but the biggest thing I get is people coming in saying they, they're going to give this to the child shop. Is it worth it? Or would I give them anything for it? Um, perfect example. Woman came in to me, I think it was about two months ago, and said, uh, I'm giving my husband's train set to the child shop unless you were willing to give me a few pounds for it. I said, yeah, let me have a look at it. It was 60 years worth of collecting. It was over a thousand pounds worth of trains, carriages, train, track, turntables, you name it. I ended up giving her 200 pounds for it and she was going to chuck it in the charge shop. Yeah. And every single piece was Triang, Hornby, boxed, mint. I filled the car from front to back and I got a big seven seat of people carrying and I filled it. So, but free stuff, I do have it. Uh, to be honest with you, I've had it off YouTube and all. I've had people because they, they like the films and, the, and things. Um, they've come up to me at the car boot sale, Jeremy, uh, one of my followers, um, him and his brother Simon, they come up to me in uh, Bessemer Road car boot sale and I was selling and he bought a little Grogs from the Pont Preeth Grog shop, uh, Dragon, Welsh Dragon, he came up to me and just handed her over, it's about £30 worth, he said, yeah, have it. I said, how much do you want? He said, no, have it. I'm, I enjoy your videos, I'm just grateful and some of you. I still got it. Fantastic. So I was just getting uh, swept away with the chat there. Um, okay. Question says, Adrian, do you need an apprentice? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you talk a good game. I need to subscribe. So it looks like you've gained a subscriber there. Uh, thank you. Uh, believe me, you'll have a shock at some of the things I find. Uh, all my videos, I, I show them what I've paid for the stuff. I show them then what the stuff's worth on eBay sold listings, mm. um, you know, and I give them a good look. Um, so yeah, they'll they'll be shocked. The ones that go across will be shocked at what I find and what I how little I pay. Just going back to that that story that really rang true with me about the lady coming in, and she 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 assigned virtually no value to that train set. Right, she was going to give it away for nothing, and yeah. she thought you might give her a fiver or something. But she came in and saw me, and she said, "I got a train set." She said, "And um, literally, I thought it'd just be you know one of these homey modern homey train sets." Uh -huh. And she said to me, "It's my husband's train set. I'm going to give it to the charge shop. Do you want to come and have a look? See if you want to give me some fish." She said, "I can't carry it down." And she was you know in the seventies, I think sixties, seventies. And I thought, yeah, I'll call up. And I genuinely thought it'd be one box with a couple of trains in it. Mm. Thinking, you know, and honestly, if if you've seen the video, um, there's, I think there's six locomotives, all as if they were bought today, still in the box, not a scratch on a mint, beautiful uh, locomotives. There's power packs. Do you know, they even had underlay for the track to protect the track, stop it from scratching. Yep. He literally, he must have spent thousands on it, and it must have been his life. Genuinely, it was his life. It was all set up in his attic, so he had miles of track. And she put no value on it whatsoever. She was happy to just chuck it out and give it away to the charity shop. So when I gave her £200 for it, it was the best thing since sliced bread for her. Yeah. Now, for me, it's it's on eBay now. It's, it's on for £1,000 on eBay. Um, and I've no doubt by Christmas it'll sell. Yeah. I love selling Hornby. I've, I've dabbled in it over the years, and it always goes. If, if you price it right you will sell it there's a demand an endless demand for that stuff if i split it up right generally if i split it up i double i'd make two to three thousand everything i was pricing up the power pack was like 80 pound um i had three of those uh, each little signal was like six and seven pound on ebay I had dozens of those the turntable was nearly a hundred mm -hmm. and i had two or three of them boxed mint you know it was shocking if you actually added up every component it was thousands of pounds worth 
yeah because it reminds me i think i shared this before but when we used to have the our, our shop was um media so it was games mainly a game shop really and we did a lot of the retro stuff so i'd buy that in over the counter exactly as you described yeah the amount of people that were coming and they'd just browse and they'd glance in one of my glass cabinets and say oh that's an old nintendo and they'd look at me and go do you buy them then i say oh yeah yeah there's, there's some good money in that just bring it in I said well i would but i binned it all last week and the amount of times i heard that people are coming and say oh i cleared out our loft last week and i threw all of that away I had yeah. loads of boxed, what are they called? Oh, Super Nintendo, was it? And I'd be just crying in front of them. It's mad, though. People just, if they don't know, they don't assign any value to it, and it's as simple as that. Well, I've got, a, Go I've got a niche market I have. Um, you've got a very small little antique store in the market in Aberdeen, but sh there is nothing really antique-wise between Cardiff and Brecon. So I've got like 50,000 people in a radius where I'm the um, pretty much... Soul antique store. There's a little shop up in Merth Tidville, um, but he doesn't do the stuff I do. He does more furniture. I'm all porcelains, jewelry, works of art, decorative arts, things like that. So I've got a niche market. Um, and it's not just a niche market for selling, it's a niche market for buying. The amount of people that come in and you know they'll they'll go like that, I want to sell our gold, check on the scales, and they don't care if it's half carat of diamond in it. They're literally weighing it in. Mm -hmm. I'm buying diamonds in the store for scrap value of gold value. It's shocking. Very fortunate to have a niche market. Yes. Oh, I just noticed Kirsten said Simon Mitchell came in to see me in the shop today. It was great to meet him. Funny you should mention Simon. I've been chatting to him a lot recently since he's come back from his travels because um, he's writing a book. He's going to be uh, joining me for a similar chat that we're like we're having here next week. So um, yeah, keep your eyes open for that. I think we agreed on Wednesday is going to work. So yeah, that should be really interesting. Uh, oh, Fritz has just said he's subscribed to your channel. Thank you. Which is great. I just say thank you to South London reseller there. He's just commented he uh, loves my videos on glass. So I just want to say thank you to him. Fantastic. Um, What's your eBay name? I'm interested in the trains. Do you share your eBay store? Yeah, it's Antiques Arena Clearance. You've got to add the word clearance after Antiques Arena because somebody had already stolen Antiques Arena. Ah, is that with spaces in or? No, no, it's all one word, all one word. Antiques Arena Clearance. Okay. But wow. if you want to see, if you're interested in the train set, go and watch the video first because, oh my God, you'd be surprised how amazing the video is of it. It's so much stuff there. It's shocking. That um, it might, yeah. If if that video might be hard to find, what you can do afterwards is copy the link for that and drop it in the comments below here, and then you'll be able to find it straight away. Yeah. Oh, Zahir's in. Hey, mate, how are you doing? Uh, he says it's funny how one man's tat is another man's treasure. Yeah. I once sold a locomotive from a from a brand I'd never heard of for two hundred pounds within hours of listing. Yeah. That's the thing. Knowledge is, is is key. And as Walter's been explaining, I mean, it, it fascinates me that you said you're self-taught. Yeah. Um, before we go, let's just end on that. So you say you're self-taught. Is that book reading as well? You must do a lot of research to learn the final. Started off, a um, little story. Started off and there was a friend of mine who used to sell antiques while I was selling junk at the car boot sale. And he refused to help me. And I used to watch him go around and he'd be selling 18th century drinking glasses for stupid money. So what I'd done, I used to go to the booth sale and I'd say, oh, you can go off if you want and I'll watch your store for you. And he'd go off buying happily, thinking nothing of it. And I'd be sat there studying every single piece he had and every description he had on the pieces. Right. And I would literally spend hours. I'd watch his store, I'd work for free just so I can handle the stuff he was buying and read his descriptions, because he always put a description on the stock. and Because there is nothing better, you can read a thousand books. There's nothing that will compare to handling the feel of an antique and again, to know what it feels like and looks like, the weight of something, everything. You need to handle. And to be honest with you, if you can't handle, go to an auction house and handle them free of charge. That's a tip I'd give you there. Go to an auction house and handle your stuff. But anyway, um, I used to go watch his stall and I'd do that. Then he still refused to teach me, so I used to buy the stock off him with the descriptions. So then I'd take it home. I'd have to pay, let's say, 40, 50 pounds for one drinking glass that he bought for 10 pence that day. And I'd put it on the shelf and I would, you know, 
I'd go out and I'd buy 50 glasses. I don't care if I spent 50 quid. And then I'd come home and I'd compare them to that one glass that I'd bought. And that's how I'd done it. And then, of course, I'd buy the books. But books are very expensive. Yeah. I've seen me pay £100, £200 for one book. Um, and think nothing of it. And if, you, if anybody has seen my library, I've got about 1,000 books in my library. I haven't read them all. If I see a book on a car boot sale, I buy it, put it on the shelf. And one day, I'll go up to that shelf and it'll be there when I need it. Yep. Um, but that's how I'm self-taught. I, I learned the hard way. No, nobody was there helping me. I had to pay for everything, and I learned with mistakes. I'd buy stuff, and it'd be wrong. Fine. I'd sell it on, I'd get a couple of pounds back, and I'd, I'd reinvest it. I learned the hard way. I lost a lot of money. I'd, spent, I'd say I spent thousands in learning the antiques, and I wasn't afraid to pay for my education. Um, if somebody had something I wanted to learn about, I'd buy it at full price. I wouldn't care. Just to have the example in the house, then I'd go home and read the book. At the moment, I'm on. Um, I'm trying to learn Chinese porcelain, so I've bought about 500 examples of broken Chinese porcelain. That most people bin, and I've spent probably three or four thousand pound on a lot of Chinese porcelain at the moment, and probably another 500 on books. And I haven't got half as much books as I need. But when I finally learn it, it may be five, ten thousand pound in. One bars will cover that ten thousand pound. Yeah. So that's how I'm self-taught. It's not easy, and it only hasn't been an easy road, trust me. No, and that's how I've done it. that last couple of minutes you just described, because, of course, we, we all like to talk about when you pick up a picture for 30 quid and try and sell it for a few thousand and that, and it all sounds so easy and glamorous. You just explained why you are successful at buying and selling antiques, because you put years of hard work in. And there aren't really any shortcuts. That's the thing. You've put the graft in, and now it's paying off. Yeah. And well, There's no shortcuts, and believe me, it was expensive. Yeah, very expensive. Where people pay for uni fees, I bet I've paid as much, if not more, for my education in the antiques. And I'm still learning every single day that we can still make mistakes. I wouldn't consider myself an expert in anything. I am just a general dealer with a general knowledge. Mm. But what I have got is a laptop, and I'm willing to dig and research. I'm not lazy. I'm willing, if I buy something and I don't know what it is, I will ask for help. But I tend to find, I'll try and research myself first. Because that's the way you learn. If you just go to somebody, watch this, and they say it's such and such, you don't learn nothing. So yeah. I don't take the easy way out. I only ask for help if I'm stuck. I'd rather do the work myself. Yep. Fantastic. Well, what a wonderful way to end. Um, that's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've had a lot of people pop in. We got up to 150 viewers at one point. Um, I know a lot of people have said they're going to go over and, and sub to you, which is fantastic. If, if, if the only thing that comes out of this is more people find your channel, then our work here is done. So thank you so much, Walter, for spending some time with me. We'll have to do this again at some point. Definitely. Or I'll come and guest on your channel. That'd be a laugh. You can ask me all the questions then. <laughs> Yeah, you can explain to me all about this Amazon thing because I was considering doing it until I've seen some serious horror stories on people paying Amazon storage and getting really stung and things like that. So, yeah, we'll we'll cover that another day. You yeah, can, Amazon, you know, this yeah. Amazon stuff works. Well, if you've ever watched Tom and I talk about Amazon, we both do it in quite a big way. Tom does it in a huge way, and we can slag off Amazon until the cows come home. So, yeah. <laughs> Same with you, mate. <laughs> anyway, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much again, Walter. Uh, if you haven't already been over and had a look at Walter's channel, please do. There should be a link below. Um, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you Bye. very much, everyone. Bye.